Good evening. What is the Matilda effect? Is it over 11 million people tuning in to watch a single sporting event? Is it the historic success for a football team in a home World Cup? Maybe it's all of these things and more. And tonight we will find out. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to you on this chilly Canberra night to the National Library of Australia and to this book event. Uh, my name is Luke Hickey. I'm the Assistant Director General of the Engagement Branch here at the Library. Uh, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge uh, Australia's First Nations peoples, the First Australians. Uh, as the traditional owners and the custodians of this land, I uh, give my respects to their elders past and present uh, and through them to all Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, thank you for attending this event either in person or online to our online audience, uh, coming to you from the National Library building here on beautiful Ngunnawal and Nambri country. Uh, alongside the recent Matildas phenomenon, uh, hopefully a watershed moment in Australian sport, uh, we are hosting this event as part of the program of events supporting Grit and Gold, uh, Tales from a Sporting Nation. A little plug for our exhibition book uh, upstairs. Um, you might wonder what the connection between a library and sport actually is, um, but our exhibition uses a rich collection uh, of books, magazines, paintings, drawings, photographs and memorabilia to celebrate Australia's rich sporting history and its effect on our culture over the years. Grit and Gold is on show at the National Library until the 5th of November and we hope you'll take the time to have a wander through the exhibition following tonight's event. With us tonight uh, are our guests, um, Fiona Crawford first, uh, who is a writer, an editor and a researcher whose work spans social and environmental issues, the arts and football. Her writing has appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, The Big Issue and The Conversation, among many others. Fiona is an adjunct lecturer at the Queensland University of Technology's Centre for Justice. And in 2019, she co-authored Never Say Die, the 100-year overnight success of Australian women's football. The Matilda Effect was released in May this year and is published by the Melbourne University Publishing on display in front of Fiona and Grace there. Joining Fiona in conversation uh, is a face that's become much more familiar to many of us in recent weeks, uh, Grace Gill. Grace is an accomplished Australian footballer and commentator. Uh, she has played for Canberra United in the Australian W League, for Slovakia in the Czech Women's First League, and has represented Australia as part of the Matildas national team. A uh, real privilege to have one of our Matildas alumni here tonight. If you were one of the record number of people tuning into the FIFA World Cup, uh, Women's World Cup over the past several weeks, uh, you will have heard Grace's excellent and expert commentary as part of Channel 7's coverage. Please join me in welcoming Fiona and Grace to discuss the Matilda Effect. Well, thank you so much, Luke, and thank you everyone for being here tonight and I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we're meeting this evening, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. It's wonderful to be here. And Fiona, it's wonderful to be alongside you and welcome and congratulations. Thank you. You too. <laughs> I feel like I'm in quite esteemed company, particularly <laughs> after you commentated the most popular, uh, what is it, the most watched uh, match or broadcast in Australian recorded history. So yeah, what a time to be alive. Well, yeah. thank you. That's very kind. Um, we are here to talk about this marvellous book, The Matilda Effect. And I, I want to start at the top, I want to start with the title mm -hmm. of the book because I found this fascinating. It seems the obvious book choice title, The Matilda Effect, but there's a bit more behind this title. Can you share? There is a lot, actually. So I originally had another title that I wasn't very happy with when I pitched it to the publisher. I won't even tell you what the title is because I just wasn't happy with it, but I thought the marketing team will help me figure that out. But while I was writing it, I was... I was still sort of, yeah, churning it over in my mind and eventually I thought about um, the effect that the Matildas had had on the landscape, particularly because they play the world game, so when something shifts with the Matildas in the world game, it actually has implications for all women and all women's sports and so I literally put in the search terms Matilda effect and as I did that I went, that's actually the title. Uh, but once I hit return, I was a little bit disappointed because I discovered there was already a thing called the Matilda effect and I thought, oh no, like I can't use this, this is, it's already been done. Uh, and then I realised it actually was a scientific principle, which I'd never heard of because I have a creative industries and sport background. Um, yeah, it turns out there's a thing in science, which I know has been in the news this week as well, but uh, of women scientists' contributions being overlooked or misappropriated or misattributed, sorry, to the nearest male, which 
is actually quite relevant to <laughs> many women in many um, industries, including women's football. So I thought, this is actually the title and this is really relevant to the book. So it changed the opening and, yeah, it went from there. And I've heard the people, everyone using the Matilda effect throughout the tournament and I think, yeah, I, I hit on something really fortunate, that's for sure. Yeah, incredible. I wasn't aware of that scientific background of the names. So by pure coincidence, really, that this existed long before the Matildas, the team, existed yeah. and is now the title of your book. I am intrigued about what the original Oh, it wasn't title. good. Okay. It wasn't good. No, no. <laughs> All right, no. we might come back yeah. to that one later. I have to say that the Matilda effect is also apparently in the Australian curriculum, so it does give me hope that students coming through from grade nine onwards will actually know <laughs> so what I didn't know. So. So if we do cast our minds back a few years ago, what actually made you want to write the book? What led you to begin the journey of the Matilda effect? Do you know, I never got to play football growing up. So you would have met me probably about 2010. I had discovered women's football in 2007 when SBS first showed um, the World Cup. And that was the first time I'd seen the national women's football team. I actually went, wow, these people are remarkable and started just trying to find out a little bit more about them and there was no information available. So I started interviewing them and writing them, because, uh, writing about them because I do have a background in, in that area and the more I found, the more I wanted to know and the more I realised that, hey, there's really a story here. And I think with women's football, there's this really fa um, fascinating intersection of not just sport but politics and gender equality and human rights issues and you have these people who are operating in this space who have to be, I think, quite remarkable because you don't have any kind of funding or resources and you're up against it. There's no one really... Not, I don't want to quote Gianni Infantino, but, you know, <laughs> you, you're having to choose the right battles and push open doors that apparently are open for you, but, you know, it's a, it's a tricky space to be operating in. So to succeed in that arena, I think you've actually got to be quite extraordinary. And you've also got to have, I think, quite a wicked sense of humour because most of the people I encountered, and you'll see it in the book, they tell really fantastic, witty stories. Mm. I think, yeah, that's been their coping mechanism sometimes when things have been quite tough. Mm, definitely. Mm. And I guess there's a, a thought to, well, I want to start writing this book, but how did you actually go about beginning? Was it the process of reaching out to a lot of people, as we saw throughout the book, you spoke to an incredible number of people mm -hmm. who are so well involved in the sport and have been for a long time, but when did you really put pen to paper and begin the process? I think the answer is I've probably been writing it for years in small fragments, or I had, and much of the history that I knew uh, was because I was there or was part of it behind the scenes working on the social media, so things like the Snoop Dogg I was there in the lobby with the team. I was there when Heather Garriock, you know, stopped security. It was the, she's tiny. I don't know if you've ever seen Heather Garriock in person, but she's not a big human, but she's, yeah, she's fierce, like, in, in the best possible <laughs> way. Yeah, so she stopped these big burly security guards and said, no, the team wants a photo with Snoop Dogg. So it's moments like that um, I was there and I witnessed firsthand, but I also knew there were these amazing stories that I just, I'd heard fragments of or I or I didn't know at all and wanted to understand how all those pieces of the puzzle fit together. So, oh, you know, I, I wanted to write it to understand it in a lot of ways because that's, yeah, in, it's through writing that I actually start to understand things. And I wanted to understand how the Matildas got to the point that they are now. I think looking at this team over this last month, you would think they've always been, they've always had these resources or they've always had this success and or it feels a little bit like overnight success. But I'm really fascinated by all those elements of how it all fits together and all those um, small moments that actually turned out to be quite big foundations that, that they could build on to here. So I started writing it in, you know, on my phone, jotting down notes, lots and lots of fragments. I have real envy for writers who are able to structure books and just to, <laughs> I am not that writer. It's, it's painful, it's messy, it's a big process. Uh, and I knew elements of what I wanted to write and then would sort of reach out to people. And I mean, you know yourself, I, I'm one of those people, I send you an email saying, hi Grace, me again, <laughs> just wondering if um, you would mind answering a few questions. And I don't know what you think of some of those emails where you go, I don't know what this is for, but you know, I'll go along with it. Trust or, in the process. Yeah, trust yeah. in the process. So yeah, that's, and the good thing about women's football is it's a small community and people are quite generous and, and quite giving. I think until now they haven't necessarily known 
that their stories were valued or that they were important, but we're starting to really see that. So initially they would sort of be not sure why you were contacting them, whereas I now think when you contact them, they go, okay, I understand that this story is, mm. is important and I've got a contribution that should be documented here. Yeah. So if we fast forward to, well, just a few months ago, really, when the book was released, not long before the World Cup, and I, I want to read just a line that I thought was quite fascinating, that this was written before the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And the line says, And in 2023, when Australia and New Zealand co-host the Women's World Cup, the Matildas will no longer be a curtain raiser or a footnote in history. They'll be the main event and story. So... Did you have an inkling? Did you know that what we were about to see was going to be such a historic moment? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That throughout the event, because the book actually had... I mean, the lead time for, print, for printing books is so long. So that book had to go to print. Hats off to my publisher because uh, they, they did let me push it up to the line a little bit. So I submitted it, a final manuscript in September last year. And you think about how long ago that is uh, before... Yeah, the tournament was a year even, ago. Yeah, it was a year ago. Mm. It really was. Mm. And uh, even people would, hadn't really turned their minds to the tournament until January. Like, I felt like there was a shift in January where everyone went, OK, it's 2023, it's World Cup year. So to be writing a book and to be, yeah, trying to predict, um, it was hard and it was terrifying because you, you, want it, you don't want to miss out on anything. And there was actually a flurry around, I'm going to say February, March. I would have to look at my... Um, diary, but yeah, there was a flurry around February, March, where quite a few things happened. There was like the Visit Saudi sponsorship, um, the ticket sales went nuts. They had to move the stadium uh, the, to the eighty thousand mm. seat stadium. Um, I think French captain Wendy Renard had said, "I'm not going to play for the coach." There'd been like some real ructions and some real key moments, and of course, we were past proofing stage, we were past layout stage. So I kept having to email my publisher saying hello, I'm so sorry, but something really important has happened <laughs> and we just need to add just one sentence. And so even things like the Visit Saudi, you'll notice there's about three or four words there, not a whole line, because I was trying not to affect like page breaks and all sorts of things. So <laughs> they were so patient with me and they were so good and they said, look, we understand that's what happens when you write, you know, um, you know contemporary history. Uh, but yet, once it went to print... I, I was quite anxious right up until right into, up until the tournament because I thought if it, something really big happens, um, yeah, I'm in trouble. But it was quite remarkable after that after that real flurry. Um, yeah, it, things settled down again, and then throughout the tournament, it was just really affirming actually that so many of the themes that I had covered or I had identified or touched on that yeah, like you're saying, that line really, really did play out, um, but also beyond my expectations. Mm. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, I think it is fair to say, um, but also makes that so much more impressive that you'd almost manifested this, this tournament mm. in a way that I don't think any of us could truly, oh. truly appreciate. It's very kind that you say that, but I think it's probably... <laughs> um, I think it's probably that those themes are perennial in women's sports. So some of those gender equality issues that we are fighting over and over and over, um, you know, different different um, characters, but the same issue coming up over and over again. There were definitely some cool moments, though, when, you know, I'd written a lot about the hijab, so we know that um, there was a time when women were being prevented from playing football at a senior level um, under, you know, spurious medical concerns, and that um, uh, Moya Dodd and Michelle Cox, who are former national team players for Australia and New Zealand, respectively, had been instrumental in overturning that ban. And that was only in like 2011, 2014. And we knew there was going to be like a lead time on those in, in order to see. And because Moya talked about it, she said, that's great. We've now got girls and women able to play in hijab or safety hijab, uh, which means an extra 800 million women can play or girls and women can play. Uh, but how long is it going to be till we see a, someone playing that at a senior level? You've got to think mm. of all the de development phases. And then we actually saw the first player in Morocco. And so that was a really kind of goosebump moment for me. Mm. There, there were definitely a few of those where I went, wow, OK, we're seeing this play out already. Mm, incredible. Yeah. Um, I remember travelling for probably what would have been one of my, my first trips as part of the World Cup and through Sydney Airport and your book being alongside <laughs> the likes of Sam Kerr's book and Hayley Rasso's book. And that mm. was the table of 
soccer books yeah. that was on display. And what's the response to the book for you been like? It has been so generous and so surreal. Yeah, like you're saying, is going through so many airports. Um, fortunately, I'm anonymous for the most part, so <laughs> you can walk up and have a look and see where your book is in a bookstore and not look like a complete idiot. <laughs> uh, but very kindly, lots of um, friends have actually been sending me. I get lots of random messages now saying, I saw your book in you know, this place. And uh, there, was, there was a moment last week, because it was book week last week, and I think many of you would have seen how many um, children turned up dressed in, as Matildas, though they were not, but there was definitely at least a couple who had my book, they had Sam Kerr's book and of course <laughs> Hayley Rasso's, which was really wonderful, but yeah, it's been so uh, kind and so generous and probably the, the nicest thing has been some of the former Matildas, because probably they're the first audience, or if, if I have not represented them fairly or truly, um, yeah, probably that's what I cared about the most. And when I ran into Melissa Barbieri at the airport, I was horribly tired. I felt like I had not had any sleep. And it was a very early flight, and I ran into her at the baggage carousel. And um, she just said to me, oh, look, yeah, they're, they're talking about your book, and they're all, they're all liking it. And so I thought, OK, well, that's, that's mm -hmm. a sign it's OK. Like, if the former Matildas are OK with it, it's been true to, true to their stories. Were you nervous about that, about representing them completely. accurately? Yeah. yeah, completely. And I feel like I'm losing my ears a little bit, so... But anyway, um, we... Yeah, because I've written the first two books about the history of women's football in Australia, um, it's not because I think I'm special, it's because I've, I've just gotten there first and done sort of the hard yards, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to convince some publishers to back me, which is been a whole thing in itself because um, there's been a lot of no's and a lot of, as anyone in women's sport will tell you, that you know there's not really many resources and you're constantly being told there's no audience, there's no market for it, you know, nobody wants to watch women's football, nobody wants to read books about women's football, so when you are pitching that to publishers, it's a really tough sell. Uh, so, yeah, it's been... Um, I was really nervous about it because it's been so hard to get them up and then once you get them up, you, you want them to be good enough to kind of break open the, the space um, so that other people can also get their books published. So mm. when you're the first book or two, if you don't get the, the first bits of the history right, you know, <laughs> <laughs> feel the pressure. Um, I did hear Jeans Williams, who is a football academic from the UK, one of the leading academics in the world, and she sort of said, um, she talked a l recently about and we're writing an imperfect history because when there isn't documentation of women's football, which there isn't, if you weren't there, like I was for you know events like Snoop Dogg, um, you, you're trying to gather up pieces that you don't know exist or you don't know what you're missing, you don't know what you don't know. I said that to so many interviewees. Um, I just don't know what I don't know, so please tell me. And yeah, so you, you write something and then you hope that you've got all the pieces of the puzzle there. And if you don't, you think, OK, someone's going to come out of the woodwork and tell me. They, they absolutely will. Uh, but, yeah, it's really affirming to know that, for the most part, you've got the, at least the foundations there. And ultimately, as a fan, like many of us in the room, of, of the team, of the World Cup, what was your experience like to then sit in the stands and, and see these games live? I am still processing it. I don't know if you are as well. It's, I think everyone who's been in this space for a while knew the potential of women's football and you can hear that in the interviews with like Eugenie Buckley for example is saying that this is the largest women's uh, football or sporting event in the world and Australia doesn't know what is about to hit them I mean that was a, that's one of my quotes that I kept the quotes that I kept thinking about throughout the tournament because like wow she really did nail it oh, there were so many moments that it felt like a cultural shift and I loved all those moments where that really surprised me, like um, Aloisi saying mm. he was really happy to be relegated to being the second best you know, um, penalty taker. Or I was reminded yesterday of you know, that international flight where everyone was watching the penalties, except for the person watching Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, and that, and how many, that was everywhere on my social media. Like Everyone was posting it for days, and it remains one of my favourite moments from the tournament. And... Gosh, just, I don't know, were there moments like that for you or just...? Yeah, I, I think um, it's fair to say the tournament exceeded expectations and I knew it would be big and I think everyone knew it would have a bit of a seismic effect but not to the degree that it did and the fact that 
the Matildas played in seven games, all of which were completely sold out. Uh, over 400,000 fans attended just the Matildas games. Um, that is incredible because we had the Matildas uh, send-off game on the 14th of July in Melbourne, and that was a record-breaking crowd, about 48,000. And that was huge, and we thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. But n I don't think at that point we realised that then every stadium thereafter would also be that and some. Yeah. So to sit and be part of that was quite overwhelming, quite emotional, yeah. um, and, and I'm, I'm really happy that it exceeded expectations yeah. because it, it, it did in every regard. I feel like and it's even like one moment was so big and then it quickly got surpassed by something. Like even like the Canada game was so big and when you think about it now in relation to the, say the quarterfinal with the penalty shootout, it's, oh, they were just, just what And even the amount of people who turned up to the, even not just the Matildas games, but you know, mm. you're at Colombia versus, yeah, it was just Nigeria versus and um, Haiti. Like I couldn't believe how many Haitian fans they were and I was like, they're everywhere and they were fantastic. Yep. And yeah, everyone really got on board with it, so. And you mentioned the penalty shootout oh. game, which I think we're all still emotionally oh. not yet recovered no. from. <laughs> I saw that you could have a replay of it recently, and I was like, who can no. watch this? Who can Absolutely watch this? not. <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, <laughs> but tell me, where were you? Where, where were you sitting? Where were you watching from? What was your experience for, let's just call it the France game? I was immediately behind the goal where they were taking the penalties. Um, yeah. It was, <laughs> not it a was bad seat. Not a bad seat. It was intense. There were people standing around me who couldn't watch the penalties, who were actually, like, facing back towards us while the rest of us were... I didn't have that luxury. Oh, oh, no. I, <laughs> that. I had to be eyes on that one. Exactly. <laughs> I couldn't actually stand still. I, had my, I just had to jiggle my legs the whole time, so I was just... You're standing up, sitting down? Everyone was standing up. Yep. Everyone was up. There was no, yeah, no chance of sitting down. Um... I don't think I've had such a collective experience with so many people feeling so tense. In uh, it was, and I completely lost track. Maybe because I was in the stadium. Maybe because it was happening right in front of me. I probably could have looked at the screens, but I don't know. There was too much going on. I I had no idea even who was by the end because it kept going for so long. <laughs> who is this the winning penalty? I don't know. And then someone would miss, and so I just had to kind of give up and just someone's going to take a kick. And I had to wait for the rest of the crowd to erupt before I could go, OK, it's, yay, it's done. But, but then I was actually hit by this just absolutely unexpected force of emotion. And mm. I ended up actually really ugly crying in the stadium. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know if it was just me, but I've seen a few women posting in recent days, like um, Sam Squires, who's a football journalist, who's been in the trenches for years supporting women's sport when nobody really loved it. And she had this, like, same, and she posted, you know, footage of herself. Like, the force of emotion, I don't know, it was just such a big moment, and I think you could feel how the hard yards that it, it had taken to get you there, and you could feel that seismic shift where something had just shifted mm. and we were not going backwards from here. Is mm. that... I mean, you had to keep it together for the nation. I don't know. <laughs> for the nation. I'm not, I'm not so sure that I did, but I, had to, I did have to watch... Um, and it was a pretty a pretty moving experience. Mm. So uh, we had we sort of have a plan in commentary where you've got your full time production schedule, and then if it goes to extra time, if it goes to penalties, you know we throw back to hosting. We come back to the commentators. So we had a brief throw back to hosting just to say, yep, this is what's happening. We're going to penalties. So Mel McLaughlin and the crew, Bruce McAvaney, they filled that time. And during that time, um, David Bashir and I were chatting back to our director, our producer. Okay, this is what's happening. David Bashir says to me, can you, can you just keep me honest? Like, let me know if it's going to be the winning penalty. I'm looking at going, not meeting. <laughs> yeah. But we had the producers in our ear, directors in our ear. Um, oh. And I, I, I remember I set up my phone. We had this brief break while we threw back to hosting. I set up my phone, so I've got this footage of um, Bash and I. And as the penalty shootout's wearing on, you know, you see us sort of calling it and completely forgot about my phone. And you're right, it... A penalty shootout, that was, it was a record-breaking penalty mm -hmm. shootout, never in men's or women's World Cup history has it gone that long. Um, but when it went to sort of the sixth, the seventh, seventh kicker, I think one of the most impressive things was actually the girls kicking to, not to win the game, but to stay in the game. That, to me, that pressure was, yeah. was palpable yeah. and, and terrifying and exciting. And um, I was jotting down, I've got the sheet of paper somewhere. I had, um, I, had, I had France, I had Australia, and I had the names, and, I'd, and I've 
it probably looks like a scrawl of a mess now, but I'd have a tick or a cross if they yeah. did or didn't get it, so I could sort of see where we're up to. Um, and we also had our producer in our ear saying, this one to win it or has to convert. So you know, you've got constant communication coming through. Um, and when Courtney Vine stepped up to take that one, we knew that if she scored that, that she was going to win it. So that, that happened and um, David Bashir sort of did his part and then we just let it breathe because so often in commentary, some of the most beautiful moments are where just the crowd noise and the celebration mm -hmm. and the pictures tell the story. You don't need to speak over it. Um, but meanwhile, <laughs> you hear him talking, I'm punching him, I'm <laughs> slapping him. Then I look back <laughs> on my mobile phone footage later. Um, mm -hmm. The response is, yeah, so emotional and, and in commentary, there's, there's not just me and Bash, there's sort of commentators from all over the world nearby us and you're just looking around at seeing the different reactions, yeah. people crying, people deflated, people dejected, people celebrating, people fist pumping. Um, and after we let that nice moment of pause play out and, and I come in to do my part as ex expert commentator, my sentence, my, my voice just, just broke. And I think in those moments, they're the most authentic, most emotional, necessary moments to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was my story. And it was, it was an, similar to yours, with the exception of the ugly cry, <laughs> it was <laughs> the overwhelming emotion yeah. of the moment. Yeah. And, and it was exactly that. It was so massive. I mean, I didn't realise till later that the it broke the decibel, like the sound barrier, not the sound barrier, but, you know, <laughs> it's just pretty impressive because Suncorp does have some quite big acts go to it. So, yeah. But it did match what the experience was like because that roar of the crowd mm. was like a physical, like it went through you. Like mm. you, mm. It felt it like visceral. there was... A, yeah, it was mm. visceral and it was just... Yeah, there's actually a really awesome guy up the road at Caxton Street. I don't know if anyone goes to Brisbane very often, but there's like only a few really cute Queenslander cottages um, in this now really built up area around the stadium and it's very expensive real estate. But there's a couple of like, there must be rent like rentals and there's a guy who basically was out there just had his own music going because Caxton Street goes off when, you know, there's big matches on and he was just having a dance party the whole tournament and I thought, this guy is just, you know, <laughs> he is all in for the Women's World Cup. He's like, right, what game's on today? I am a, you I know, I, <laughs> and I am going to bring the party to Caxton Street as everyone comes down and yeah. I just thought, there were moments like that and then you went into the stadium and you had a moment like that mm. and it was just, yeah, yeah. It, it felt like what it must have been like to be in the stadium for Cathy Freeman's race. I don't know if anyone here has been there. Like, you know, I saw that on TV and it was that moment. I'm seeing a hand up the back there. Yeah. <laughs> a couple. Yeah. It just... Um, I know... And so many people have told me since about where they were in that moment. Mm. Like, everyone talking about that penalty shootout. And, you know, I've got friends who said I had to take one for the team. You know, one child was a flag bearer at the game, so it was holding the doing the very important stuff, wearing that. Actually, had to wear um, kits that ended up being too big because they didn't have any um, normal size. So they were wearing an extra large men's kit and they were like this really young, tiny girl. And I said, that's fine. You've just had the quintessential women's football experience. Yeah. That's been like every Matilda. Um, but she said, I had to take one for the team. So my husband took the daughter to do the flag bearing. She had to go to the other daughter's dance recital, but she said every mother at the dance recital was kind of like, yeah, yeah, great, and was like watching the penalty shoot out on their phone. So there's, and yeah, like the international flight and the person watching mm. Lord of the Rings who I'd love to talk to because I don't know what they thought was going on, but Can't be sure. um, it, it was a match that stopped a nation and I just yeah. didn't know that I knew women's football was going to be... It was that good. The product's always been that good, but mm. I just didn't know we were going to have that moment. No, yeah. and I don't think we did either. I think that was um, that was a watershed moment, and you know, 11.15 million viewers is a fairly terrifying thought, <laughs> um, particularly <laughs> listening to my voice. But that was yeah. groundbreaking, and I know that there was some further research done to suggest that the actual numbers around that were nearer to that of 17 million, so oh. sort of 65 percent of the country tuning in to this game and, you know, to your point about the Cathy Freeman moment, a lot of the Matildas talked about that moment mm. being inspiration for them. They would have been very, very little when, when that happened <sighs> back in 2000. But yeah. also in a full circle moment, I, I worked alongside Bruce McAvaney who yeah. called that incredible moment. So it was really quite lovely to hear his reflections mm. of being involved in that and then fast forward 23 years, being involved in this, and he said, this is bigger. You know, stats aside, data aside, he said he can feel it 
and this is bigger, and this is a man who is iconic and has been the soundtrack to many of our, our sporting moments in, in, in decades gone by, and really special to have him part of that. You know, not a, not a footballing person, but mm. you can't fault Bruce for the, the way in which he prepares for these things, and he understood the how big a moment this yeah. was for the country. And I think to the point of the, the roar when, when that penalty went in, the only point I would say I felt it was even slightly bigger was the England game where Sam oh. equalised. Oh. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> if you want to talk about noise... Yeah, true. ..in the stadium, oh. un unbelievable. And um, to, to give you a gauge of how noisy it is, I'm sure anyone who was in the stadium could have could have understood that. But again, I'm, I'm, I sit alongside David Bashir. We're, we're closer than this. We're sort of at arms arms length apart. We both have distance. Head, punching yeah. distance. Punching <laughs> yeah. distance. Both have headsets on. And if you take your headsets off to talk to each other, you can't hear each other. Like you're oh. yelling at each other. That moment when Sam scored was just yeah. unbelievable. Unbelievable. The noise. And again, they're those moments where you just let it play out because it's spine tingling. Um, everyone is on this journey, and you know, we, of course, we would have loved to see that game fall perhaps a different way. But mm -hmm. it was it was a glimpse, and a, and I was really pleased for Sam too that with all of her difficulties in the tournament that mm -hmm. she she got on and she was able to to score a goal. That would have been so so special for her. Oh gosh, I know because I mean you. If you were writing a Hollywood script, you know, <laughs> I feel like that's what the tournament they had, where they mm. were in danger of not making it out of the group. And I was genuinely frightened because I was thinking, oh, gosh, like the conservative media is really going to come after them. It's, you know, um, I can just... I was visualising the headlines. And yet then we had this... They made it out of the group with that phenomenal Canada game, which then, you know, everyone was like, how good is football after this? And then the country was then just absolutely behind them. And then they kept just kind of levelling up and levelling up and mm. levelling up. And, yeah, that quarterfinal. And then to go to that semifinal, obviously not the result we wanted. But, yeah, for Sam's goal, mm. where she was also having that story, that parallel experience of the team was almost not making it. And then it's, you know, its most famous player was also almost not making mm. it onto the pitch. It was just, yeah, like I feel like probably there's somebody trying to write a film script right about now that, yeah. And they should. <laughs> they should be. That. Yeah, I would. That. It would be massive. It would be massive. So yeah. do you think, sort of all of this in mind, and we've all had these experiences, you know, walking through airports, you, you see people in a Matilda's scarf or a Matilda's jersey and complete stranger, but there's a knowing nod and there's a bit of an mm. acknowledgement. It might be a conversation, uh, a sharing of stories, and it's, it's well and truly united the nation. But do you think this is genuinely one of these dial shift moments where this has changed the culture of, of sport in our country? I think so. I, and there's a, I've got a quote in the book from one of the staff members, and I was part of some of those conversations. Like, so Joe Fernandez, who was a long-time team manager, she was doing the, really the hard yards for about 13 years when they had no money, and she was magic in the way she was able to make, um, make things happen for the players and not let them know how hard it was behind the scenes to kind of pull it all together. Um, but she said, you know, there were so many moments where you could feel like, this is it, we've turned the corner, things are going to be really great from here. And I know I personally was part of that in the 2011 World Cup where um, they'd made it through to the quarterfinals, they're up against Sweden, they'd played really well throughout the group, but I think you couldn't watch the Australian games in, because we were in Germany and I don't think they were broadcasting them here, or they finally were putting it on at a prime time or something, and there was a bit of media coverage and a bit of um, groundswell, and so we were like, this is it, you know, the Matilda's going to do really well and Australia's going to fall in love with them, and then they had a real shocker against Sweden, which is still painful to even think about, and it all fell away, and that's happened so many times, um, because we went to the Olympic qualifiers after that, and we didn't, we didn't get through. It was a bit controversial. Um, North Korea had been there, and they'd actually been kicked out of the World Cup for drug, um, some very sad, yeah, um, drug offences. And so, but there was no drug testing at the Olympic qualifiers, which were only six weeks later, and so we missed out by like literally one point, um, and it all fell away again for about four years. So, there were so many of those moments where I thought, this is it, we've turned the corner. I don't know, this one feels different. Mm. It, feels, it feels like the foundations have shifted. It feels like it's now, I don't want to say too big to fail. I don't want to jinx us, but I don't know. I think maybe some of those conditions are right. We've got now, um, the players are now actually earning some money. They've got some profiles. They're able to play year round. They're playing at really big clubs like Chelsea. 
um, social media is enabling them to connect directly with that audience. And we've now got the data to show uh, people are buying jerseys, which for so long you couldn't buy because they didn't think there was a market for it, so they didn't manufacture them. Uh, we've got ticket sales data, which, again, we didn't have. Mm. And we kept being told nobody wants to watch women's football, but they were not putting it on in stadiums or making it possible for you to attend easily or to watch on TV easily. And now we've got it on mm. you know, pay TV as well as um, free to air. We do need to talk about the anti-siphoning laws, but you know that's a whole other thing. But I don't know, it feels like some of those conditions are right now that um, they're not going to go away mm. in the same way that... Does that, is that what it feels like for you or is it...? Yeah, I think so. And I think we can, along with anti-siphoning laws, we can add um, goalkeeping jerseys to the list of things to talk about later. Oh. We'll come back to that one. Yeah. But no, I do, I, I do think so. I think there has been a seismic shift. But I, I'm interested in your thoughts about this Matilda's team. What do you think it is specifically about this team, this group of girls, this brand that unites a nation in a way that other sports, other codes, other athletes hasn't, haven't quite been able to do in the way that the Matildas have. What do you think is that point of difference? I think it's partly because it's the world game and so there's that, that international um, reach that I think has not been there. But I think as well, and this is something they'll have to be considerate of as they move forward and we see increasing amounts of money and sponsorship coming into the space, but going back to what we were saying earlier, um, to succeed in a space where you've had no resources or attention or you've got to really want to be there and you've got to really be working hard. So I think you've, you can't, you've got to be a more fully formed human because it, you can't be your only pursuit. And so you're having to do other things or you're having to really dedicate yourself and commit yourself. So when you're there, you're taking it seriously. Um, you are doing the hard, you're doing the hard yards you're, and maybe that makes you more interesting to engage with or it makes, that's what makes them so fascinating to watch and to learn about and it probably what makes them um, somebody that you want to admire or look up to. Mm. I don't know, is that... Mm. Yeah, no, it's hard, kind of, they, they do have some sort of X factor, don't they? That I think they do. I think the, the stories as well around the, the personalities and, and their challenges that they've had um, both as athletes and, and individuals resonates mm. with a lot of us. I think uh, the Disney documentary was well-timed for that as well mm. because it gave a, a really lovely insight to, to some of their experiences. But Fiona, I'd say as well that, that your book has played a really important part in telling these stories and I think the timing of it has been incredible. The fact that the team did so, so well, mm. even more so. But mm. I, I really want to congratulate you on this marvellous read uh, thank and thank you for so much for sharing your knowledge, your expertise and for being one of those pioneers in this space long before it was mm. a cool thing to talk about. So please join me in thanking Fiona Crawford for the you. Uh, we, we do have some roving mics around the room, which if, if you have any questions, um, more than happy uh, for you to ask, but please do wait for the mics to reach you so that we can get those picked up. Thanks. Just as um, we're getting ready uh, with the microphones, um, Grace is so right about that roar. Uh, my boys and I were watching at home. I reckon we nearly blew the windows out <laughs> at home from the couches um, where we were. And Fiona, while that process of writing might have felt ugly and messy to you, I think what you've ended up with is an amazing reflection Thank on you. the beautiful yeah. game. So I'd um, like to call now for questions from the audience, please. Grace and I were saying before that we, our predictions before the World Cup about who was going to do really well... Yeah, not so good. So we will take any questions other yeah. than predictions around <laughs> results. Don't ask me to predict yeah. anything ever again. <laughs> Gosh. Thanks. Um, I'd be keen to sort of know if you had a take or an insight in terms of other countries around the world. So obviously Matildas was captivated by Australia, but yeah, was there any kind of other kind of big stories elsewhere? I, and I was definitely being contacted by a lot of um, international media, which did surprise me. So they were very interested in the Australians and then also interpreting their own country's um, experiences. So, for example, a South Korean journalist contacted me saying, look, the numbers of players in South Korea is kind of where we were a decade or two decades ago and they can't really get the uplift that we can. So they're grappling with some of the issues that, yeah, the Matildas did a decade ago and, and wanted to do a comparison. Uh, I know... German um, journalists, there were, yes, yeah, Spanish um, journalists from Turkey as well. So they were definitely watching the Matildas and seeing, and I think everyone could just see that this tournament was something extra. Like it was, uh, 
those of us who've been fortunate to go to World Cups before um, can tell you that they have been really great, but this, this really did kick it to another level. So, yes, uh, international media was definitely picking up on it. The, obviously, they were framing it through their own lens, but it makes me think, yeah, it did transcend the Australian kind of experience. Mm. Yeah. I think I, I sort of add to that by saying as well, as co-host with New Zealand, for them to win that opening game oh. against Norway, oh. their first ever win in a World Cup. And that, you know, we can't begin to imagine what that meant to them as a country mm. and, and to those players who had never picked up a three points at a World Cup before, huge. But then also some of the lower ranked nations across the tournament, mm. for them to have the success probably far beyond expectations. Uh, Colombia, one of them, Haiti, one of them. And now we know about these players, Linda Caicedo, an incredible 18-year-old yeah. player who's overcome ovarian cancer that three months ago, I'd say, most of the people in this room didn't know about. Mm. They're the kind of stories that I find so, so inspiring. Mm. Um, and, you know, a World Cup with, with the nations that have all come to it, we've, yeah, we've had our eyes opened in the very best way. Mm. And probably, I mean, given how well they've done and given that many of those federation, uh, those players having to battle federations, I'm not going to talk yeah. about Spain because, well, that's a whole other thing. But, um, like, for example, Nigeria or Canada, for example, who, yeah, Jamaica, who had to crowdfund to get there. Like, I'm curious as well, that success, and it probably elevated the, them in their own host, in their own nations, um, which might actually mean really positive things and, yeah, for actually getting some funding and some resourcing that they really, really need. So, mm. yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting space to watch. Yeah, I think I'd, I'd add to that. I was really fortunate prior to the World Cup to be involved in a, a podcast series where we spoke to a few key experts from across the globe and so many uh, consistent stories across the conversations were, oh, yeah, but the team had to battle the Federation or the team had to fight for funding or the team had to strike to play. And of course, the Matildas had that experience as well back in 2015 around their central bargaining as well. Um, but that's not an uncommon story in women's mm -hmm. football. And I think for these teams to come on the world stage and perform in the way they did makes that all the more spectacular. Um, mm -hmm. And even to the point of some of these players that attending the World Cup and, and the money provided by FIFA, just purely by their attendance in the group stage, genuinely life-changing. Mm -hmm. So the 30, 40 grand to these girls who would never have seen that kind of money in their lives, um, that's really, really special. Mm -hmm. And being paid directly to them for the first time yep. as well, so not eaten up by federations and sort of redistributed to men's football, which yep. has been very common in the past. Yeah. I uh, just wanted to ask your opinion on the recent um, social media activity by the Wallaroos. Just wondering if you think they might be able to, to leverage some of this goodwill, some of the Matildas effect to, to help their own um, team prepare for their next challenges and, and also build that sort of um, foundation of support or do you think there's a chance it might backfire on them? I was really heartened. I mean, I was so sad when I saw it and when I saw that letter, I thought that could have been written by any women's, football, women's sports team because the experiences were so recognisable and so relatable. But I also just went, yeah, go. Like, this is... Um, I think I might have said it in the book, but basically, when, yeah, when it, something benefits the Matildas, it benefits all women because of that world game kind of connection. So, yeah, this is what... I, I'm really excited to see what this means for the Wallaroos, for AFLW, for maybe some smaller you know, netballers who won the World Cup and didn't receive any pay. Like... Um, we saw it, I think, off the back of 2015, where they, the AFLW and cricket and everybody else was able to benefit. So I say, yeah, all power to the Wallaroos, and you know, I'm happy to <laughs> happy to support them however I can because I do think there's just a bit too much media attention now. For um, it's probably not a good time to be a male administrator trying to justify not funding women's sports. Too <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, hi. Um, I was definitely all in in this World Cup. I think it was incredible. But my question to you is, what is what what next for you and the next book? Because you see it now, you see it growing, and and even when I was a young girl, we didn't have, we couldn't play soccer. I watched my brother play soccer, and we could only wait till we were nine to play netball. Mm, and same. you can see this seismic change. And you're right, it was visceral in in the stadiums. But we've got Olympics next year, 2032. Olympics in Brisbane, you know, it'd be really great to see a, your follow-on book to say, well, what's that prediction? What is the Matilda effect come then? Like, can you imagine what it's going to be like if this really does take off? And I think it will because it's, you know, 
maybe the data around how many girls have now signed up for summer comps or for next year and, and you know, utilising this effect to start building the, the game more here in Australia. Yeah. Like the prediction for 2020, 2032 is going to be buy my tickets mm. now. For <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we were saying it's probably going to be... Because people over the tournament, as they realised how awesome it was and really wanted to get a hold of some tickets, we were having people come out of the woodwork to be like, mm. is there any chance? You know, the number of people... I could have sold my tickets so many times over. Um, yeah, my head is spinning with the possibilities. And I think, like you, I'm yeah looking at... We've got the Paralympics as well. I'm really excited about the Paramatildas. Um, I work in a space with the big issue a lot and with the Homeless World Cup, so which uses football... For, um, addressing um, homelessness and other so, um, mental health issues and drug and alcohol addiction issues. So um, I'm excited about the potential of it expanding beyond women's football as well and that uplift. Um, yeah, my head is spinning with all the possibilities. I know Sarah Walsh is like... I think somebody quoted the other day saying, um, have you ever seen anyone do their job better than Sarah Walsh? So she was the women... She's the head of women's football at Football Australia. She's a former Matilda. And, yeah, she's done some really hard yards over the years and it, half, I think at least half this tournament's success is testament to her and her team. Um, yeah, there's a lot. I think there's going to be so much to come and I'm mm. excited because she talks about... I think we've gotten over the why or the, the value-based arguments, like is it worth it and should we really be funding women's football? And she wants to talk about the potential and the opportunities and I think that's now where the conversation is and I'm excited, yeah, for what's coming. Mm. I'm glad you've asked that question. I did have a question written down that I didn't ask for you and it was, when's the sequel coming out? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. it, it's so true. Uh, I think I, I was listening earlier today to a podcast that was saying that Football New South Wales reported that their junior summer registration are up something like 180 percent so these are the numbers that we're now dealing with and importantly that piece around legacy which was a big part of Sarah Walsh's job is ensuring that we've got the right resources funding government support mm -hmm. infrastructure to support that additional 180 percent uh, worth mm -hmm. of kids and children boys and girls wanting to play mm -hmm. and the, and like that attitude and all shift and that cultural change that comes with that as well where yeah, we, everyone keeps talking about, you know, that generation of boys who now grow up who have always seen women, uh, girls and women play football and, and are idolising women footballers as well. And I don't even know where that's going to end. Like, it's going to mm. be, yeah, phenomenal. Um, hi, Lamoya. Yep. Uh, really interesting talk. Um, the actual whole event was totally scripted, even up to the... Al before the first match when you suddenly find out Sam Kerr's not in the team and the, you could feel the country go, oh, my God. Yeah. Um, but it was weird because it did actually provide, uh, I guess, the, the bonus so that we learnt by default all about the other Matildas. Because um, I never saw the um, documentary that was on, I guess it's on Disney or something. I don't have access to such things, but I'm naturally intrigued. My question, though, is the... Um, Matilda effect going forward, interest is massive. The spotlight is going to be huge, one would suspect, on some of these players quite suddenly. Um, are they mindful, I hope they are, of managing that because it isn't always going to be sun, sunrise. It's going to be some criticisms will come. Sometimes it'll be harsh, but sometimes it's going to be you know, legitimate. And will they have the necessary supports in place to manage that transition? Because it's... A, they're going to go global. It's, it's a big change. Hmm. I really hope so, uh, in answer to your question. There's a few different mechanisms for that. Um, one is immediate support networks, which some players are really fortunate to have in family and friends, others less so. Um, of course, there's player management as well uh, to talk through some of those options. And I think to, to use your example about some of these players who are going from what they were pre-World Cup to now is a player like Claire Hunt, who had only ever played domestically. Um, mm. She debuted for the Matildas in February mm. of this year at the Cup of Nations and has now started in every game since. And rest assured, she's, she's going to be picked up by a, a club internationally, whether that's in, in England or the WSL, where so many of the girls are playing. And that's a huge shift from a country girl playing in Australia, moving overseas. And I think from our side of things, we see... We see the glossy mm. social media post, oh, I've signed with so-and-so, and you see them holding up the jersey or signing the contract. But what that actually means to someone's life is, 
is unbelievable. It's, it's a comfort zone, it's international travel, it's language barriers, mm -hmm. it's moving away from everything they've ever known. And um, I had jotted down a, a, another line from the book, Fiona, that you said, for every on-camera moment that sparks admiration, there are plenty of off-camera moments that we'll never see. Mm -hmm. And that really resonated with mm -hmm. me because while these women are our heroes and we look upon them so, with so much admiration, there's so much hardship behind this, mm. this travel, this journey as well. Um, and I think as well, look at the squad of 23, five of those girls didn't see a single minute. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the hardest positions to be in because they're out there celebrating, supporting their teammates. And as a player, as a former player, I've been in both positions where I play every minute and I play no minutes at all. And I know what that feels like. So I can watch and talk about every single player on the field, but rest assured, my thoughts are with Lydia Williams, Tegan Micah, Ivy Lewick, Claire Wheeler, Kaya Simon, the five players who didn't see him in it, because they're so important. And Claire Hunt, Courtney Vine, we know Courtney's staying in Australia, but I, I really, really hope that they have the right support, financial advice, um, networks around them to mm -hmm. ensure that they keep their feet on the ground. And I mean, Grace is actually much more qualified to answer that question than me, <laughs> so I'm not gonna, but I will add that, yeah, just in the book, I was really careful and I guess fortunate to have been a staff member around the Matildas and I've seen them do the hard yards um, and I've seen, yeah, the player who is injured, who doesn't get, or who, someone like an Ivy Lewick who just missed out on so many World Cups and then she finally did make the 2019 World Cup and then she had the most amazing making the 2023 World Cup but for all of that time she actually played 180 seconds of World Cup football so she played for three minutes um, which was in 2019, she didn't make it on the pitch this time and and the challenges of that, like, it's such an enormous accomplishment because she is at the top of her game, you know, the best of the best in the country and you, you're still not quite making it across the line. And that does, um, yeah, I, I was really careful in the book to try to celebrate all of the contributions of the players and to acknowledge that, yeah, for the really good, the good moments where you say, yeah, Courtney Vine scored the winning penalty and, oh, my God, the whole love, nation loves her. Um, but to contrast that with the really challenging moments of, say, Ellie Carpenter, who is a phenomenal player just had a moment, um, got beaten by a player, as you do as a defender. Um, and yeah, that goal, well, yeah, against England. And I know she copped a lot of um, social media abuse, which was horrible. So there's, it is definitely a double-edged sword. I know they have um, like a team psychologist mm -hmm. now. They do have things in place. They try to keep them in a bubble and it's not because they're trying to be, trying to, um, they think they're celebrities or anything like that. It is about managing that mental health and that, because the pressure that would have been on them as the home nation was just, beyond. I think probably that's even the testament to their performance at the World Cup is to, to play the way they did um, when things were so, so tough and there's so much expectation on you as the host nation and so much expectation on Sam Kerr alone. Um, and the obsession with her injury was just, just beyond. Um, <laughs> Lauren Hanna is one of the team physios and I interviewed her for the book and I very deliberately didn't um, message her during the World Cup because I thought... Um, to be the physio that has to try to rehabilitate Sam Kerr's calf <laughs> to, get, to get her back on the back. That is a pressure moment. She has a bit going on. I don't want her to feel like I'm trying to find out what's going on, so I'm just going to leave her be to do her job. So, but yeah. she can now add that one to her CV because she did remarkably well to <laughs> get her did. back. <laughs> she did. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, like, how do you think the Matilda effect after this World Cup will also help, like, grassroots football? Um, coming back to the point earlier, because I know a lot of, like, very promising girls, like, coming into MPL and then dropping out after a year or two because they can't, like, afford the fees to, like, like play at the club level, like, the MPL level, and then go through the process of, like, moving up. And do you think, like... I know there's 200 million in women's sport, but how do you think like there will be funding like contributed to these clubs to help these like girls that are like just like falling off, you know, the wagon as they like um, mm. go up. I feel like Grace is probably more qualified because Grace is affiliated with the PFA as well, so the players' union, and is looking out for players' mental health and that you know the that real pathway that, that players have, I agree 100%. I think um, as much as we really, really want to celebrate the success of this World Cup, I mean, we, we know now that this is probably where things get a bit more real and there's 
um, yeah, it is looking at those really hard questions of how do we ensure that um, you can you can play the sport if you are not necessarily from a high socioeconomic or a mi middle class background. How do you um, if you are from a refugee background or um, or a, a regional area where you don't have as much access? It's yeah, it's some of those really tough questions. I have real questions about the two hundred million dollars. I was so excited when they announced it, but I really want to see the detail of that and how that's going to play out because. You know, I was quite fascinated that, you know, when, when you fund men's sport, you would say, I'm going to give $200 million to the NRL, for example. I can't ever say them, see them saying, I'm going to give it to men's sport and then put everybody in the same bucket. So as much as it was a great move, um, I also thought it was quite symptomatic of how women's sports are treated. It's like we're all lumped in the same bucket and then we've got to figure it out together. And where does women's sport start and finish, I guess, is some of the questions I've got. Does, you know, obviously football, netball, but what does that go down to? Like, you know, rhythmic gymnastics, I don't know. Where does, yeah. Mm. Um, it's a, a great question and a big question as well. And I think in a country like Australia, that is always going to be one of our challenges, purely for the geography, the size of us. And, and you're right, Fiona, we are always going to miss players and, and kids who live in remote communities who can't afford to play and that's where it's so important that the funding is directed to some of those grassroots levels or to <coughs> those NPL levels so that the, it's dispersed and that doesn't get lumped with the juniors to pay the seniors. That's, you know, we want to move away from that model but um, it's a great question, mm -hmm. <laughs> one that I'm not sure we can tackle in this room tonight but I really hope to see that that flows on through to uh, our young players because that's where our future is. I think if you were a funder, you would be, and a sponsor, you'd be really looking at throwing some money towards women's football um, right now. So that does give me hope that there will be some scholarships and some grants and, yeah, some money really injected into that space to, to help with the next generation of, of Matildas. So, yeah. Um, with the whole Keepers jersey fiasco, mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. because Mackenzie did so well, do you think that'll change? Like, do you think we'll get... A keeper's jersey, or go ahead. I was. Did you see the croissants made their own? I don't know if you've seen. There's some super fans, and they uh, they're called the croissants, and they make their own costumes and turn up. And they, were, yeah, they made their own Mackenzie Arnold kit, uh, brick wall, and they did little um, like brick walls that they kind of had as like wings when they lifted up. Um, yeah, the pressure is on, and I think that's a really exciting thing. Is it's before I think manufacturers could say or could dismiss it or, or they could ignore because there wasn't really that groundswell. But I think what we've seen has been <laughs> so public and so visible. So, yeah, I'm excited. Mm. I think it's... Com I don't know if it's coming. They definitely said the UK... There was four teams yeah. which they sort of backtracked on. This is Nike. Um, whether or not that changes specifically for Mackenzie's shirt, I, I really hope that mm. it does. And I think it will be one of those... Uh, lesson learnt moments for future mm. World Cups, future tournaments. I, th I do think that'll change purely by demand and necessity. Yeah. Yeah. I think I said something like it's a really good symptom of women's football, like how well it's succeeding, um, but at the same time how it's still being hampered. Um, mm. But yeah, croissants can also help with figuring out your own DIY kit in the, in the, <laughs> in the interim. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both for a wonderful conversation. I wanted to just pick up on the pay parity point that you referenced earlier about Jamaica and Nigeria, South Africa, Canada, they were all threatening not to get, the, get on the plane and come mm -hmm. to Australia. And I was really heartened by the leadership role that the PFA, the Players uh, Football Association took, uh, saying the Professional Football Association said that they wanted to increase the um, collective bargaining opportunities around the world and to get better pay parity for those other countries so that we can lift the standard for everyone. The Matildas have managed to achieve a, a, an element of pay parity and we want to see that in other places. So I just wondered what was next. What are the next steps for the PFA and what kind of leadership role can Australia take to spread the Matilda effect around the world? I thought that's a question for you to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Much Thanks, more Catherine. Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, it is, it is a really good question and the Professional Footballers Association do a marvellous job here in this country and support our players, not just the Matildas, the national teams and the Socceroos too, but our A-Leagues teams and the fact that our women domestically have the support in a players' union um, is a lot more than other countries have. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd say that they do a spectacular job. 
Um, I had an interesting conversation with uh, a woman who actually played in the A-League, Gabby Garten. She played for Melbourne Victory, um, Argentinian, um, and, play, and played... Sorry? Goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. And played <laughs> in the 2019 World Cup for Argentina. And I asked her about the success of the men's Argentinian team um, in, in Qatar and if she felt or thought or understood that any of that would be felt back through the women's program. And I had this conversation with her probably in about May or June, so months and months after Argentina had won the Men's World Cup. And she said that it was something that they hadn't seen come through yet and that she hoped it, it would. Um, whether or not it actually does, your, your guess is as, as good as mine, but this is where the players' unions are really good in collectively ensuring that the players get, whether it's pay parity or proportionally, right, what they deserve. Um, and I think the important part of that is the collective part, that the teams are doing this together and that they have someone representing them because the players alone, you know, they shouldn't have to. It shouldn't have to be a fight that they fight. But this is where the unions, um, in, in that case, are so, so important to facilitate that. And I'm definitely interested. We're seeing now... I mean, you're seeing Angel City, for example, so you're seeing a different model. Um, I think it's a, the Matildas have obviously... So it's a good time to be, you know, renegotiating their CBA as well. Um, you're seeing a lot of those former players who previously were lost from the game. So with the exception of, say, someone like Amoya Dodd, who has been able to stay in the game in to some degree and at a, a um, board or governance level. Um, but you're seeing now, so Sarah Gregorius, who's a former uh, football fan, um, who's really smart and really funny. She was hilarious to interview. Um, she, they're doing really good research, really good work at the FIFA Pro, which is like the international um, players' union level. Um, I don't know. You've got someone like an Ali Riley, who I think is once her... She's an also um, well, captain of the football fans. Once her career ends, she's gonna, they're going to continue in the space, and they've got this really interesting... Um, experience of coming through with no money and then some money and then now being able to turn it into a career where they can make um, good changes for everyone coming behind them. So I'm interested in seeing people like that move into the PFA kind of space as well. So, yeah, I would... I think it's a good time as a woman to be trying to negotiate some of those um, because it's too public, a bit like the Wallaroos we were talking about before, is if you are not stepping forward and supporting women's football now or putting some decent conditions and um, money on the table, I think it's actually going to be too public now to, um, yeah, to, to get away up. with. Mm. Yeah. Terrific. Um, Fiona and Grace, thank you so much. Uh, for tonight's discussion. We could have probably fielded questions for another uh, two hours, I reckon, uh, after that. We did have a question online which was a bit similar to the ones you've had around the grassroots uh, football. And we, perhaps we might just finish off with just one thing that we can do locally ourselves. You saw the armies of people marching on stadiums, on watch parties, on all sorts of things. You saw national institutions like ours lighting up in green and gold to support the teams. Is there something that everyone in the audience and people who are watching can do to really get behind um, local girls and women's sport? Yeah, I think the obvious one for me is go along to the A-League men's and women's. These are where your national heroes are made. Every single player in the Matildas started in the A-League and I guarantee if you watch the A-League this year, there'll be a handful of those players that in years to come will be in the Matildas and you get to sit here and say, yeah, well, I was there when they were starting out. So get behind your local competition, get behind the domestic league because it's, um, it's pretty special. And I would probably, I would agree with that 100% and then probably just say, um, support as much as you can to contribute to that data because that's really gonna be what drives, um, it's the decision makers, uh, if they can demonstrate, like, so Sarah Walsh or the people who are having to have these really hard conversations now need that data to be able to support the argument that women's football is worth supporting. So uh, tune in to, and so you're part of those broadcast figures. Follow the social media accounts and like the post so they can show the engagement. Uh, follow all the players, you know, if there is uh, an opportunity to, you know, write a letter or something to a, a local minister, just so, because all of that gets counted and when they say, look, we're seeing this critical mass of people behind this, um, yeah, or there's the ticket sales or the jersey sales, it's all that data that they go, yes, this is worth throwing more money at, worth investing, worth exporting, worth putting on it, um, you know, good hours, worth making available to the general public. And, yeah, that's the, the hard data is what... Um, it's the, 
It's the reality of it. You know, I, I'm not a data person myself, but I, I am conscious that that's actually what's going to uh, change the game for us. Right. Thank you so, both, um, so much, both, for the, all of your insights, particularly into the inner sanctums, both as player, commentator, uh, author, and sharing some of those stories from former Matildas as well. Uh, we're really grateful for you sharing those. Um, rest assured, you weren't the only one uh, ugly crying during some of those uh, penalty shootouts <laughs> <Which no. laughs> uh, as well as part of it. And uh, I suspect that the next episode of the Matilda Effect, you won't have as much problem pushing it with publishers as you might have in, know, well, the, uh, that, that's, in the first you know, the one. Hope. I'm hoping there's going to be a lot more books and you know it opens it up to, to lots of other people to be writing books as well. So I'm kind of keen to see what's coming next. Yep. Mm. Fantastic. Um, that does bring our event to a close uh, tonight. I do hope you can join us upstairs in the foyer uh, where our library bookshop is open and Fiona has kindly agreed to sign copies uh, of The Matilda Effect. Uh, you may also uh, take the opportunity to have a quick look at Grit and Gold, uh, our exhibition uh, Tales from a Sporting Nation, which actually does close on the 28th of January next year. So it's getting an extended uh, summer rung, perhaps uh, courtesy of the Matildas as well. Uh, a couple of other quick plugs uh, before we go. If you enjoyed tonight's discussion, uh, you might be interested in some of the upcoming events. On the 5th of September, we'll be hosting the Great Debate uh, with the Academy of the Social Sciences, Does Sport Unite or Divide Us? Uh, and on 3rd of October, Mich uh, Michael Winkler will speak about Grimish, his 2022 Miles Franklin shortlisted uh, exploded non-fiction novel, uh, the story of Italian-American boxer Joe Grimm's tour uh, of Australia in 1908. Uh, you might also be interested in having a look at our YouTube channel. We had a wonderful uh, Women in Sport uh, panel event uh, in the middle of August with uh, Michelle Heyman, Holly Furling and Vanessa Lau, um, which was a really great event. It's available on our YouTube channel, as all our uh, uh, events are, and tonight's will be if you want to share and forward that on to other people. Um, thank you so much for coming, uh, and thank. please join me again in thanking our wonderful guests tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.